Thank you very much for joining our study. This is a personal understanding uh, of the Baha'i Writings. It is only my view on it. For an official view, turn to the Baha'i Scriptures themselves, please, and visit baha'i.org. Um, I wish to thank the uh, Baha'i World Administration, uh, all those that are serving their communities out there. And please note that there is an audio file, uh, so you can listen to this presentation instead of viewing it. And also, any quotes that are used will be in a PDF in the description. So this presentation is titled, A Utopian Ideal. Oftentimes, when people encounter the Baha'i Faith and they hear what Baha'is believe, the vision really looks utopian, uh, impossible and overly idealistic. And in order to get a sense of this, we really want to first look at a writing of Shoghi Effendi, the Guardian, one of the central figures of the Baha'i Faith, and see an expression of the grand vision of the Baha'i Faith, and start from there to get a sense of empathy <laughs> with people, because when you really, really concern yourself with what the Baha'i Faith actually says about the future of humankind, uh, it's, it's easy to understand how people see this. So we're going to start with a, a large quote from the Guardian. The unity of the human race, as envisaged by Baha'u'llah, implies the establishment of a world commonwealth in which all nations, races, creeds, and classes are closely and permanently united, and in which the autonomy of its state members and personal freedom and initiative of the individuals that compose them are definitely and completely safeguarded. This commonwealth must, as far as we can visualize it, consist of a world legislature, whose members will, as the trustees of whole mankind, ultimately control the entire resources of all the component nations, and will enact such laws as shall be required to regulate the life, satisfy the needs, and adjust the relationships of all races and peoples. A world executive, backed by an international force, will carry out the decisions arrived at and apply the laws enacted by this world legislature and will safeguard the organic unity of the whole commonwealth. A world tribunal will adjudicate and deliver its compulsory and final verdict in all and any disputes that may arise between the various elements constituting this universal system. A mechanism of world intercommunication will be devised, embracing the whole planet, freed from national hindrances and restrictions, and functioning with marvelous swiftness and perfect regularity. A world metropolis will act as the nerve center of a world civilization, the focus towards which the unifying forces of life will converge, and from which its energizing influences will radiate. A world language will either be invented or chosen from among the existing languages, and will be taught in the schools of all the federated nations as an auxiliary to their mother tongue. A world script, a world literature, a uniform and universal system of currency, of weights and measures, will simplify and facilitate intercourse and understanding among the nations and races of mankind. In such a world society, science and religion, the two most potent forces in human life, will be reconciled, will cooperate, and will harmoniously develop. The press will, under such a system while giving full scope to the expression of the diversified views and convictions of mankind, cease to be mischievously manipulated by vested interests, whether private or public, and will be liberated from the influence of contending governments and peoples. The economic resources of the world will be organized. Its sources of raw materials will be tapped and fully utilized. Its markets will be coordinated and developed, and the distribution of its products will be equitably regulated. National rivalries, hatreds, and intrigues will cease, and racial animosity and prejudice will be replaced by racial amity, understanding, and cooperation. The causes of religious strife will be permanently removed, economic barriers and restrictions will be completely abolished, and the inordinate distinction between classes will be obliterated. Destitution on the one hand and gross accumulation of ownership on the other will disappear. The enormous energy dissipated and wasted on war, whether economic or political, will be consecrated to such ends as will extend the range of human inventions and technical development, to the increase of the productivity of mankind, to the extermination of disease, to the extension of scientific research, to the raising of the standard of physical health, to the sharpening and refinement of the human brain, 
to the exploitation of the unused and unsuspected resources of the planet, to the prolongation of human life, and to the furtherance of any other agency that can stimulate the intellectual, the moral, and spiritual life of the entire human race. A world federal system ruling the whole earth and exercising unchallengeable authority over its unimaginably vast resources, blending and embodying the ideals of both the East and the West, liberated from the curse of war and its miseries, and bent on the exploitation of all the available sources of energy on the surface of the planet, a system in which force is made the servant of justice, whose life is sustained by its universal recognition of one God, and by its allegiance to one common revelation. Such is the goal towards which humanity, impelled by the unifying forces of life, is moving. Shoghi Effendi, The World Order of Baha'u'llah. This quote is only one quote of so many that then flesh out and expand upon the dozens and dozens and dozens of principles within it. Uh, shining light, for example, on what an international executive would look like, what a world legislature would look like, what the international auxiliary language is, the relationship between science and religion. It encompasses so many social, intellectual, personal, collective uh, advancements within the, within the world that is quite shocking when you read them and contemplate what, the, what Shoghi Effendi is actually saying here. So listening to uh, a quote like this, it's understandable why someone might see this as unbelievably idealistic, unattainable for humankind. Yet it's important at the same time to understand that that's not necessarily an argument. It's not actually a reason to not fight for it. It's not a reason to not believe it can be done. It's in some sense claiming something is idealistic often is taken as a, if you will, brush off of an idea. Um, we have this often this conflict between the ideas of idealism and realism, and it's, I think it's important to notice that this is actually just the use of terminology to at times to brush off ideas, because we also have the terms optimistic and pessimistic. That in some sense, when we call someone idealist, um, we're just stating that we couldn't possibly achieve what they're talking about. But why don't we just call that uh, pessimistic? When we call someone a realist, a political realist, um, and another person an idealist, why don't we call one an optimist and one a pessimist? And it's important to realize that the political social world in which we live is itself only composed of people. And it's the psychological, spiritual, moral, and belief states of the individuals that make up the body politic of our entire planet. So if we ourselves choose to be pessimists, it is actually a, if you will, a negative feedback loop, which creates the very problems that are causing us to be pessimist or realist. Uh, oftentimes when people encounter such a vision um, of a possible future, uh, they'll ask, like, how, how could we possibly achieve this? Um, the first thing to note, actually, is whether or not that is really a question. If someone is asking, how could we possibly achieve this, then the, then the next discussion has to be, well, these are the ways we can actually achieve it. Uh, but often the question, well, how could we possibly achieve such a vision, actually just means we can't achieve such a position. <laughs> um, moreover, we actually have to look at what are the choices that we as individuals make within the social sphere, or the moral sphere, or the intellectual sphere, today, what are the choices you make today in order to create that world in the future? And this is the, the fundamental uh, push and purpose of the Baha'i Faith, is to raise the consciousness of humankind and summon that, that, if you will, deep well of human initiative and capacity to actually create a future such as the Guardian here is speaking. This is what the Baha'is are doing globally, attempting to actually put in the hands of individuals the ability to transform society, to actually build up a new world. The exigencies of the new age of human experience to which Baha'u'llah summoned the political and religious rulers of the 19th century world have now been largely adopted, at least as ideals, by their successors and by progressive minds everywhere. 
By the time the 20th century had drawn to a close, principles that had, only short decades earlier, been patronized as visionary and hopelessly unrealistic, had become central to global discourse. Buttressed by the findings of scientific research and the conclusions of influential commissions, often lavishly funded, they direct the work of powerful agencies at international, national, and local levels. A vast body of scholarly literature in many languages is devoted to exploring practical means for their implementation, and those programs can count on media attention on five continents. It's very important to, to notice that, as uh, the World Center is saying here, that there are so many principles that we currently take for granted, that we assume as, you know, if not uh, actualized within our world, are something we all should be working for. And in many cases, great strides have been actually achieved in approaching these goals, but that they were previously, uh, it says. Uh, the, when Allah summoned the political and religious leaders of the 19th century, they seemed hopelessly unrealistic. What needs to be done is to look at the actual process of social transformation and of scientific progress, to see that the things that we once believed were utopian, overly idealistic, and could never possibly be achieved, have now actually become, at least in part, and sometimes totally, a reality. Because it's only then we can see that this, this claim that it is unrealistic, the you know, pessimistic position, is actually what blocks us from achieving it. When we look across our planet, and we look at what humankind has achieved in the last several centuries, even looking at what we have achieved in the last century, it, it's actually really shocking. Um, we have here examples like and mathematics, astronomy, the, the investigation of the deep oceans, setting uh, satellites out into space, having an international space station, um, many of the technological advancements we have achieved, but also the pushing forward of the ability of humankind to understand the natural world, uh, even to the extent of truly getting down to the origins of the actual universe itself. Um, it's only because we're really surrounded by these all the time. We live in a technological, scientific age that we don't really notice how profoundly shocking this is. So if you had actually traveled back in time, two centuries, one century, and actually begin sharing the vision of our current day in our, our reach of our understanding and our technological prowess, um, it would utterly and completely astound everyone you met. And I propose it would astound even the founders of the scientific revolution. When you first had people coming forward talking about the new philosophy, this way of actually approaching the world as it was flowering, um, they were making claims about man's epistemic reach, our intellectual reach, to be able to understand the world, and the potential for the fashioning of new technologies. Um, yet at the time when they were actually saying it, they couldn't yet do it. It was actually a decision, a solemn decision, by groups of individuals to actually go out and create it into a reality. It wasn't something that already existed that we could point to. This is why I say often, you better be able to build it. You have to be able to build the scientific world that we currently have, prior to it being real. <laughs> you actually have to have the way to put the idea of what we can actually achieve in the hearts and minds of people, so that they can catch a vision which, I guarantee, in the 1700s, 1600s, 1800s, and 1900s, seemed just fully out of the reach of humankind. But it's those individuals that actually grabbed hold of that vision and said, we can actually achieve this that then actually went out and made that world a reality. If you were to travel back in time to the 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th century, you guarantee would have heard people expressing their disbelief, 
their pessimism about the ability of humankind to do what we do today. And you would actually have to defend the abilities of humanity to that person. To say that humanity would ever actually put a satellite in space is unrealistic would have seemed sensible previously. To say that it was unrealistic that we could actually be exploring with our technological prowess uh, distant galaxies, or understanding the very natures of matter, would sound completely unrealistic. History tells us that we can, and as Baha'is we believe that it's just as the capacities for man's intellectual advancement um, should not have been stopped or put a damper on, uh, when it comes to social transformation it's the same issue. Humankind has undertaken social transformations of just epic proportions. There was a time when actually proposing the idea of democracy itself would have appeared unrealistic and idealistic. That actually we could live in a world where overt slavery does not exist. A world in which women can vote and have the freedom to actually choose their careers, and express their autonomy, where you would actually have agencies that are striving, although they may still fail, they are striving to actually help humanity globally. We have had institutions, service institutions, that span the entire world. The United Nations Children's Fund, the World Food Program, we have organizations all over that now reach far beyond national boundaries to actually help people in distant lands. Something that would have sounded utopian in a previous age. Our political organizations, while still imperfect, have actually taken leaps and bounds. At a time the idea of even the League of Nations, the unity of nations that was attempted after World War I, would have been seen as utopian, as a pipe dream. Let alone the United Nations, while still imperfect, being a forum for all the nations of the world to come together and discuss things. To go back a century, two centuries, and share with people that this is how far we would have come, would sound completely unrealistic and utopian. But we currently live in it. So to actually suddenly state that we couldn't possibly go further, is something that I actually think the lesson of history tells us we should be very careful of doing. Now, Shoghi Effendi, for example, claims within his letter that there would be a means of international communication surrounding the globe, freed from national hindrances, right? that would operate with amazing swiftness. We now have the internet. Here is another quote from Shoghi Effendi, the guardian of the Baha'i Faith. You should rest assured that your painstaking efforts will in time bear fruit, and should not feel discouraged, therefore, if you have not so far succeeded in accomplishing any tangible results. Now is the time of seed sowing, and consequently one of slow and painful progress. But the harvest, which the future shall reap, will be incalculably rich. And great will also be a reward for having so unremittingly toiled in bringing it about. I love this quote because the guardian is telling the recipient of the letter not to feel discouraged even if they have not seen any tangible results. He's stating that it's slow and painful, painstaking and tedious but that this individual should continue to work for world solidarity and the eradication of the prejudices among groups of people. And it's really important to understand that when we look at things like the emancipation of slavery, or the, the fight for actually equality between men and women, uh, and the establishment of democracy, or the building up of our scientific and social institutions, we have to realize that generation after generation, fought and toiled painstakingly and tediously 
for the development of the social, scientific, and moral institutions that we currently take for granted. They themselves pain, worked painstakingly in the seed-sowing period, and we ourselves reap their harvest. And it was only because they were willing to see, one, that it was not only possible, but probable, but also that they were willing to sacrifice in order for us to harvest that freedom, harvest that need, harvest that ease, sorry, to really eat of the fruit that they sowed. Another quote from Shoghi Effendi, Though the society which incarnates its ideals be small, and its direct and tangible benefits as yet inconsiderable, yet the potentialities with which it has been endowed, and through which it is destined to regenerate the individual, and rebuild a broken world, are incalculable. Imagine for a moment this was the Royal Society in London. <laughs> the science, one of the scientific institutions that forward and really gave us the fruit from their seed sowing time. This is exactly what they would have had to have said. That we're small, our current direct tangible benefits are limited, but it's actually the potentiality to produce a world, to produce the capacity for humankind to push back the darkness in our epistemic world and understand the natural world. Um, and this is what Shoghi Effendi is saying to the Baha'is. When you look at the development, say, of world solidarity, or the eradication of prejudice, the equality of men and women, the eradication of the extremes of wealth and poverty, is to understand that even though our direct tangible benefit at the beginning might be small, it is only by this unremitting toil and seed sowing that anyone will ever reap a harvest. The more we see the crying need of the world for the spiritual teachings of our faith, the more restless we should feel in giving out the message and improving the means of diffusing the precepts of the cause. Often when I talk to people um, about my beliefs about the Baha'i Faith and its capacity to regenerate the world, um, I will run into statistics and data surrounding the great suffering of the world. Um, as if I'm not aware of, of the problem itself. And what I think we have to realize is that it's not actually from a lack of knowledge of the problems facing it. It's actually how we respond to it. How are we going to respond to child slavery? How are we going to respond to the lack of food for millions and millions and millions of people? In this case, uh, Shoghi Effendi is saying it should create a restlessness inside of us as opposed to giving up and turning to apathy. It should stir us up to be willing to sacrifice ever more to help humanity, because it needs the fruits and harvest of the vision which Baha'u'llah has brought to us. A quote from Shoghi Effendi. To take but one instance, how confident were the assertions made in the days preceding the unification of the states of the North American continent regarding the insuperable barriers that stood in the way of their ultimate freedom. Was it not widely and emphatically declared that the conflicting interests, the mutual distrust, the differences of government and habit that divided the states were such as no force, whether spiritual or temporal, could ever hope to harmonize or control? And yet, how different were the conditions prevailing 150 years ago from those that characterize present-day society? It would indeed be no exaggeration to say that the absence of those facilities which modern scientific progress has placed at the service of humanity in our time made the problem of welding the American states into a single federation, similar though they were in certain traditions, a task infinitely more complex than that which confronts a divided humanity in its efforts to achieve the unification of all mankind. Shoghi Effendi is using the example of the establishment of the United States, of their separateness of communication, of the, the conflicting biases and prejudices, prejudices that existed within that federation, and saying, please look at this. Actually, look at the United States. 
people back then thought it was impossible to actually bring them together into one nation. Yet at the same time, the scientific and social institutions that they had at their disposal are shockingly less than we currently do. So to really again take stock of how people in very dire circumstances, in very fractured states, can actually come together to unite for the betterment of the body politic. I called this section Religious Unity uh, the most curious of claims. Because not only is the Baha'i Faith actually talking about the uh, social and political advancement and unification of humankind, and the eradication of racism, of gender biases, uh, building international auxiliary languages, um, it also is directly related to the unity of religion, the oneness of God, and the ability of mankind to recognize that God has communicated to humanity throughout all of history. Many find the idea of the various world religions coming from one divine source uh, to be just a very peculiar notion. But also because the unity of our world, the other unities that we're seeking to establish, uh, can best be achieved through the remedy of Baha'u'llah, which is the recognition of the sacred oneness of humankind, and the oneness of our own spiritual history. The objection most commonly raised against the foregoing conception of religion is the assertion that the differences among the revealed faiths are so fundamental that to present them as stages or aspects of one unified system of truth does violence to the facts. Given the confusion surrounding the nature of religion, the reaction is understandable. Chiefly, however, such an objection offers Baha'is an invitation to set the principles reviewed here more explicitly in the evolutionary context provided in Baha'u'llah's writings. I adore this quote because it tells Baha'is that they should understand that when people hear the idea of progressive revelation, that God has communicated to different societies over time within their context, um, to be peculiar. That it is something that isn't immediately obvious to many people, but given the confusions surrounding religion, we should find this both understanding and as an invitation to actually really share with them how the Baha'i see the unity of religion. Yet when many people encounter the claim of Baha'u'llah about the religious unity of humankind, um, it also sounds completely utopian. How could such a thing be possibly achieved? Yet I think once again we are um, forgetting the story of history. That we actually have a world where at one time the diverse religions, say of the Roman Empire, couldn't possibly be less diverse than what we are currently facing, relatively. And yet, from the perspective of history, a wandering itinerant teacher in the backwoods province of Palestine then united the European continent under one faith. His name was Jesus Christ. That when we look to the life story of the Buddha, Buddhists, for example, might see him as this grand figure. Well, yet we have to remember that actually the Buddha himself was a wandering itinerant teacher in the backwoods of India. And yet billions over the history have actually claimed allegiance to his faith, and he is still extolled and praised in our day. That some um, you know, a merchant from Mecca <laughs> would have then suddenly create, been the impetus, if you will, for the creation of a, an empire that stretched from the western shores of Africa all the way into India, uh, sounds bizarre. And yet this is actually the story of history. This is actually how it has played out. There is so much suffering, such a great and desperate need for a true remedy, and the Baha'i should realize their sacred obligation is to deliver the message to their fellow men at once, and on as large a scale as possible. If they fail to do so, they are really partly responsible for prolonging the agony of humanity. This is a very tough quote, because it brings up the issue of moral obligation and his relationship to the purpose of one's existence. Whether a person is Baha'i or not, right? whether the Baha'i faith is true or not, we have to realize that the prolonging of the suffering of humankind is directly related to whether or not individuals make choices 
in their own individual lives to alleviate the suffering of humankind. That we actually have to be able to rise up. Again, in agreement with the Baha'i perspective or not, that people must come to a place where they realize that the social transformations that we have already seen within human history, that the scientific advancements that we have already seen in human history, rode on the backs of individuals who believed that they had a responsibility to humanity itself. The vastness of the field, the smallest of your numbers, the indifference of the masses, must neither discourage nor appall you. You should at all times fix your gaze on the promise of Baha'u'llah. Put your whole trust in his creative word and recall the past and manifold evidences of his all-encompassing and resistless power, and arise to become worthy and exemplary recipients of his all-sustaining grace and blessings." This quote addresses several aspects. One, the, again, the vastness of the field of endeavor that Baha'is actually have to face in trying to unify the planet. That's the point of the utopian objection. The person is the person's actually seeing the vastness of the field. And at once they're actually looking at times <laughs> uh, to the Baha'i community and they're saying, well, the field uh, of, is vast and your numbers are small. And the Guardian himself in 1941 is talking to a far smaller number of people, far less resources, and in the middle of the Second World War. And it's important to notice this. But this, this quote could have been actually said to any individuals throughout history who were actually toiling unremittingly to sow the seeds that a future generation might reap its harvest. But another aspect comes in here, which is Shoghi Finney talks about the actual power of the creative word to transform human lives and thus the world. That as Baha'is, we do not believe that we are living in a just purely materialistic world, but actually that the creative word of God itself can actually transform lives, build up communities. And Shoghi Feni is asking us to actually look at the past, the obstacles we've had to surmount as a community, to gain an understanding and inspiration to be able to carry forward, to create the very world that people think is impossible. Delicate and strenuous though the task may be, however arduous and prolonged the effort required, whatsoever the nature of the perils and pitfalls that beset the path of whoever arises to revive the fortunes of a faith, struggling against the rising forces of materialism, nationalism, secularism, racialism, ecclesiasticism, the all-conquering potency of the grace of God, vouchsafed through the revelation of Baha'u'llah, will undoubtedly, mysteriously, and surprisingly enable whoever arises to champion his cause to win complete and total victory. Abdu'l Baha used often to say that the difference between a prophet and an ordinary person is that the latter looks only to the present. He does not try to imagine the future victories, and thereby forget the present trivial obstructions. The Prophet, however, having a deep insight in the future conditions of things, sees his ultimate victory, and does not get disheartened even though he sees a wholesale massacre of his followers. As Baha'is, we should follow the Prophet's method. We know that the cause will ultimately conquer, and its ranks be fully united. We know that the Master's promises will ultimately be realized. Therefore, why be discouraged by trivial oppositions we see on our way? We should rather add to our zeal and persist in our prayers and endeavors." So the ordinary person sees these forces of materialism and nationalism and racialism and ecclesiasticism. The average person looks at the vast field, all the obstacles in the way of global solidarity, of the unification of humankind in a just system of government and in the embrace of one common faith. And they see all the obstacles in front of them, 
And Shoghi Effendi is saying Abdul Baha used to talk about how the prophets themselves can look beyond the present obstacles, insuperable as they may seem, as it says, even to the wholesale slaughter of their own people, to see that it will eventually be triumphant. Once again, <laughs> this is what in every massive epistemological, intellectual revolution, every social transformation, people had to do. That actually, like, I imagine walking around in like the backwoods of, of Europe, trying to convince people who are universally actually ruled by monarchs that we can actually achieve democracy, universal suffrage for humankind. Such individuals were at that time called radicals. It is important to note, actually themselves would not see the fruit of what they were trying to fight for. In fact, for many, actually, not even their children would see it, or the children of their children. They were seeing something far off on the horizon that they knew was a better world. And that they were actually going to sacrifice and fight for that better world, in spite of people telling them that it was idealistic. It's easy to empathize, really, with the concern about the improbability of actually a Baha'i vision coming into effect uh, globally. Yet the Baha'is do not believe that humanity will suddenly, in one great chorus, seize upon the principles of Baha'u'llah. Rather, that humanity is actually facing an evolutionary process, um, the challenges and obstacles that we're facing will drive us to increasingly seek for solutions to the problems facing humanity as a whole, because we are in an age where the, the challenges that face one nation cross national borders and cannot be solved except without really taking account of the globe as a whole. Of course, humankind can and has the, in the capacity to actually choose these principles. Yet, unfortunately, it's often that, if you will, we have to keep touching the fire and getting burnt before we learn that the way that we're doing something cannot continue. The principal cause of this suffering, which one can witness wherever one turns, is the corruption of human morals and the prevalence of prejudice, suspicion, hatred, untrustworthiness, selfishness, and tyranny among men. It is not merely material well-being that people need. What they desperately need is to know how to live their lives. They need to know who they are, to what purpose they exist, and how they should act towards one another. And once they know the answers to these questions, they need to be helped to gradually apply these answers to everyday behavior. It is to the solution of this basic problem of mankind that the greater part of all our energy and resources should be directed. The future of humanity, from a Baha'i perspective, is founded in some sense on two uh, pillars. One being the individual. Um, that which comprises the entire body politic. That we have to transform the heart and the spirit of humankind to have people understand why they're here, what their purpose is, if you will, what humankind should truly be so that we can, as individuals, seek to manifest that in our own lives. That it is from individual to individual and the transformation of the human spirit and the human heart that the Baha'is are directing their forces. Because what we really need is to know how we are supposed to live, what our purpose is. The second aspect of this quote is saying, now we have to look at how to apply these things within our own lives, and as a collective. It's basically that this, this vision of the Baha'i Faith is that the individual within their own sphere of influence should first transform themselves and within their own regions and their own neighborhoods begin to actually foster a spirit of love and unity and service. But also, it's not merely that we have to understand how we should be, 
but the Baha'i Faith is offering to the world, if you will, a pattern for social organization to carry these principles into effect really on actually a societal level, through concepts derived from the Baha'i administration. And this transformation of the spirit, of the soul of humankind, upon which is reared any social progress ever, because human, human hearts have to be changed in order for us to develop a society that can actually become more harmonious as we move forward. And one of the fundamental principles of the Baha'i Faith is that of unity. Uh, Here is a quote from One Common Faith from the Baha'i World Center. The power through which these goals will be progressively realized is that of unity. Although to Baha'is the most obvious of truths, its implications for the current crisis of civilization appear to escape most contemporary discourse. Few will disagree that the universal disease sapping the health of the body of humankind is that of disunity. Its manifestations everywhere cripple political will, debilitate the collective urge to change, and poison national and religious relationships. How strange, then, that unity is regarded as a goal to be attained, if at all, in a distant future, after a host of disorders in social, political, economic, and moral life have been addressed and somehow or other resolved. Yet the latter are essentially symptoms and side effects of the problem, not its root cause. Why has so fundamental an inversion of reality come to be widely accepted? The answer is presumably because the achievement of genuine unity of mind and heart among peoples whose experiences are deeply at variance is thought to be entirely beyond the capacity of society's existing institutions. While this tacit admission is a welcome advance over the understanding of process of social evolution that prevailed a few decades ago, it is of limited practical assistance in responding to the challenge. We're being told that we can all agree that the disunity of humankind is crippling humanity. And in this quote also it's saying that the existing institutions are incapable of actually solving the problem we're facing. So the Baha'i faith and its servants, the Baha'is, are focusing on trying to unite hearts to see humankind as one human family, that we are all the children of one God, and that we can, if we deeply investigate and try to understand this principle of the humanity of humankind, we can then actually create a society. It's simply that we have to really come to grips with the idea that all social institutions are made up of people, and that it's the human hearts, the morals, and the ethics, and the visions of the people within those institutions that can create a new world. Oftentimes we're looking to some uh, technological thing that will actually solve our problems. Yet even technology itself and science itself needs a spirit to actually direct the forces of science and technology towards ends that will actually serve humankind. Um, oftentimes people will give the example of science as power, say, to eradicate polio. Um, yet we have to understand that it wasn't science that eradicated polio. It was the ethics of humankind, the will to alleviate the suffering of humanity, that actually eradicated polio. When we look at science itself and the wonders that it can create, we all know that it can actually create things that are destructive to humankind, engines of war, chemicals that poison our world. It itself is a vehicle for the human spirit. So in order for political will or technological advancements or scientific understanding to actually solve the problems of humanity, we need a collective vision and a collective desire to rise up and transform the human spirit, and to make it what it actually could be. A quote from Abdu'l-Bahá, The Secret of Divine Civilization. A few, unaware of the power latent in human endeavor, consider this matter as highly impracticable, nay, even beyond the scope of man's utmost efforts. Such is not the case, however. 
On the contrary, thanks to the unfailing grace of God, the loving kindness of his favored ones, the unrivaled endeavors of wise and capable souls, and the thoughts and ideas of the peerless leaders of this age, nothing whatsoever can be regarded as unattainable. Endeavor, ceaseless endeavor, is required. Nothing short of an indomitable determination can possibly achieve it. Many a cause which past ages have been regarded as purely visionary, yet in this day has become most easy and practicable. Why should this most great and lofty cause, the day star of the firmament of true civilization, and the cause of the glory, the advancement, the well-being, and the success of all humanity, be regarded as impossible of achievement? Surely the day will come when its beauteous light shall shed illumination upon the assemblage of men. The vision that Baha'u'llah has put forward for the world uh, is ultimately glorious. It's exquisite. And we do believe that it, these principles actually enunciated by Baha'u'llah so long ago uh, are sacred. They're not just good ideas. <laughs> They're holy and blessed principles flowing out from the will of God. But that doesn't mean that we think for a moment that it won't be hard. It will take unremitting toil. It will take courage, discipline, and tenacity in order to make it become a reality. Abdu'l-Bah here in our last quote is stating that so often in the past people have said something is unrealistic or idealistic, and yet we have actually achieved many of these things. And we have to remember that the spirit of humanity is shockingly powerful, that we can rise up as a people to actually fashion wonders of society. So will it take indomitable determination to achieve it? Yes, it will. So when I look at the Baha'i Faith and its teachings, I don't see it as utopian. I just see it as very difficult, and that it will take time. And that I myself and any who wishes to actually fight for it will not see the fruit of it, but that this is how it's always been. So we can understand that yes, the ideals of the Baha'i Faith are very high, very exalted. But to say it is idealistic is it's not itself an argument, whether or not the Baha'i Faith itself is true. We have seen humanity achieve things that constantly throughout history people have said were impossible, that now are actually a reality of our day. So the Baha'i Faith itself might be false, but to call something utopian is actually not an argument against it.